Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, hello there. I'm your host, Simon. What happens here? Katie has written me a script. By the way, this one's called Death Ship Orang Medan, and I have no idea how to pronounce Orang Medan. I don't know what it is. I assume it's some sort of death ship. Uh, but I looked it up in both of my pronunciation dictionaries and it wasn't on there. So I just resorted to guessing Orang Medan. I don't even know which country it's from. I suppose if I knew that, then I could make a hack attempt at a hackneyed. Hackneyed? What's the word? Like a, like a hacky, but not like to hack into the mainframe. You know, just like a shit attempt at pronouncing it in that accent which uh, probably would also not be very good. Uh, Katie writes this, I've never read it before, as has become obvious by now. And then afterwards, Jen, our wonderful video editor, is going to add in some uh, music, some memes, some videos. It's going to be wonderful. You're going to have a great time. Welcome to Decoding the Unknown. Oh, uh, I should explain, if you're watching this rather than listening to it, if you're watching the YouTube version, you'll see that I am wearing a, uh, a Christmas sweater. And I realize that this video is probably going to come out sometime in like February. So uh, yeah, I'm recording this around Christmas. Uh, you know, so uh, wh whatever. The jumper is comfortable and it's warm and it dates this video and whoever's watching it in July, hello. <laughs> ah, yes, I wish it was summer. Let's go. There are some stories that have been bandied about for so many years that everyone assumes by now that they're just tall tales or urban legends. More than one version exists, things can't be proven, and the details seem just too strange to be real. And yet the legend persists. Could there be something true after all, hiding under a cloak of improbability? Let's see if we can lift the cloak and have a little peek underneath to see what else might be lurking around in today's story of the Death Ship. The Orang Medan. <laughs> I feel like Katie's like pitching this like, yeah, <laughs> Simon, everyone knows the Orang Medan. It kind of sounds like orangutan. <laughs> How have you not heard of this? Oh, I have literally no idea what this is about. Never heard of this before. And everyone who it does is probably going to be like, oh, this pronunciation drives me insane, whistle boy. Ah, <sighs> disappointing. <laughs> no one cares. The mystery. The problem with this tale is that the details are not concrete. Some sources say it happened in one year, others in another, etc. But let's gloss over all of that for now. We'll come back to it, I promise. But first, let me spin you a yarn about a spooky ship and its unfortunate crew. Sometime in the 1940s, ships sailing the trading route of the Strait of Malacca received a distress signal from a vessel in trouble. The Morse code message was picked up by several ships in the area, including two American ones. The message was received from a ship identifying itself as the SS Orang Medan, a Dutch cargo ship. How do the Dutch speak? It's like uh, that girl Shadvert. Tell me like a drink. Why do I sound like Sean Connery? I am most grateful, but of course that doesn't mean that I won't sue you. They kind of speak... No, I just end up sounding like Sean Collery. How does it, you know, there's always that, there's that Grohl Shadver. Like, we don't let you drink it till it's ready. We don't let you drink it till it's ready. <laughs> ah! I don't know why my Dutch accent is Sean Connery. Oh, God. He's not even Dutch. Obviously. The message said, we float. All others, including, ca <laughs> including the captain, are dead. Lying in chart room and on the bridge, probably whole crew dead. More of Aramorse code followed, but it didn't make any sense until at the very end of when the last of when the last transmission was received from the only remaining sailor, which said, "I die." After that, nothing more was heard. Oh my God, Morse code must have been a massive pain in the ass. You're like bleeding out. The whole crew's been murdered, and you're like, "I'm dying." You can't say that. You got to be like, "Oh, I made a mistake." Ah. <laughs> oh, that's got to be a right pair. I'm so glad we didn't. I I'm like now with FaceTime and stuff. FaceTime's so good. I like every every Thursday I have a call with my with my dad. Uh, he lives in the UK. I live here in Prague. And you know, it's like a few years ago, or ten years ago, it would be like having it. You'd have to have a phone call, and you wouldn't be able to see each other, and it, the quality would be a bit shit, or you'd be on Skype, and the quality would be really shit. But now it's like, it's like you're there. You got a, 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 like a big screen. There's never any problems. And you're like, this is great. We live in the future. Why are we talking about this? Let's get on with it. Oh yeah, Morse code. God damn. Sometimes it's like Morse code leads to the wildest, like irrelevant tangents. The nearest ship to the Aramadan was the American vessel, the SS Silver Star. So the SSSS. 
um, which, you know, oh, I love it when it's just easy to pronounce English words. Sometimes when I see a script that comes in that I gotta read and it's like, Gladius Commodus the 17th. And you're like, oh God, there's gonna be so many Roman names. Oh. And then I just guess them all to everyone's chagrin, to everyone's uh, 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 disdain. Once it reached your Ramadan, the crew saw a silent ship, undamaged, just floating on the waves with not a soul to be seen. Once they got closer and boarded the boat, however, they soon realized that it was a different story. As the radio operator had said, the whole crew was dead. Men lay on the deck in death rictuses. That is a brand new word to me, and I feel like I'm showing my small brain right now. I don't know what a rictus is, but it can be pluralized, so death rictuses. Interesting. Staring at the sky, or with looks of horror or fear, on their faces. Do you like how I just don't look it up? I'm like, yeah, I don't know what the word rictus means. And I'm happy in my ignorance. Uh, and so now you will have to be. The captain and his officers were found in other areas of the Orang Medan, all dead. The radio operator was found at his post, also with fear frozen on his face. He's absolutely terrified, like, ah! Uh, even the ship's dog had fallen victim to whatever had taken place and was now snarling eternally into the void. After, or after also noticing that at least one lifeboat was missing from the Aramadan, the crew from the Silver Star decided to tow it back to land. As they were setting off, however, some men noticed smoke rising from the stricken ship. They hastily cut the line, and the Aramadan exploded into a fireball and sank down to the bottom of the sea, taking its poor crew, their dog, and its secrets down with it. So far, so not mysterious. Uh, I mean, you could get a pretty terrified look. I feel like if I had a heart attack and completely died of natural causes, I'd have a terrified look on my face because it's like, oh my god, I'm dying of a heart attack. Ah, oh, no! I have so much to live for! And so I don't think that's unusual. Um, the crew could be killed by... Gosh, you're at sea back in the day. It's a risky business. Um, I, I, could, I don't know why I immediately be like, sharks? It's obviously not sharks. <laughs> but it could have been like, I don't know, poison gas. Uh, I want to say like a weather inversion, if I knew what that meant. Um, like, you know, where it comes down and there's too much carbon dioxide or whatever, and they all get poisoned by carbon dioxide. And they're like, oh, I'm getting poisoned by carbon dioxide. Fear on the face. I don't know. I'm just speculating. This doesn't seem unreasonable so far. And then it blew up. Ships can blew up. That's blow up. That's fine. So... Did this actually happen? Did the boat exist at all? Or is it just a maritime ghost story made up to spook new naval recu recruits on cold winter's nights? I know which way Simon is going to be leaning, but let's see if we can pull any plausibility out of this story before completely ripping it to shreds. I'm not ready to rip it to shreds yet, Katie. I'm like, so far, this sounds completely reasonable. What we need to do is find out if there was actually a ship called the Aram Medan and was it sailing in this area. The US Navy, I get the feeling, is going to keep pretty detailed records. If there was a ship called Silver Star, it's definitely going to be noted in its log that they responded to a distress call because if there's one thing about governments, they love f taking notes. So let's carry on and find out. The case for the death ship. Okay, so we know the precise details are a little sketchy surrounding the incident of the Orang Medan, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't happen. It may be that because the details got confused over the years, people were just looking in the wrong place. One of the most compelling points for the existence of the death ship is its appearance in several other official reports over the years from pretty impressive sources. The earliest mentions of the Orang Medan seem to crop up in the British press around November 1940. So very contemporary sources. This sank in what? 19... Sometime in 1940. So that seems entirely on point. I mean, but it would be in the logs. The military logs would be more reliable than the press. The Yorkshire Evening Post and the Daily Mirror both published an apparent... I don't know anything about the Yorkshire Evening Post, but the Daily Mirror is probably... You know, it's, it's definitely a bit of a rag. Uh, allegedly. Both published an apparent eyewitness account of the incident under the headlines of Mystery SOS from Death Ship and Crew Dies in SOS Mystery. In the earlier version of the story, the rescue ship is not named and, and an extra distress message is intercepted first, requesting a doctor, but the essence of the story is the same. A French publication called Sepjour ran a story on the death ship in September 1941 with the headline translating as, After 20 months, the mystery of the RM Adam is solved. Uh, that's a terrible French accent. Uh, I'm not going to read it again though because... Um, well, I'm just not 
In this article, the Orang Medang is cast as a convict transport ship, later sold to a smuggler. This just sounds made up, though. It was not. It wasn't mess, was it? The story of the mystery incident comes to light via an ex-sailor on the Orang Medang and involves the ship carrying an unknown cargo and abruptly changing course after a few days at sea. Well, are they carrying an unknown cargo, or are they trans- transporting prisoners? I don't think the prisoners would be unknown cargo. So what's what's below decks? Uh, grain. Why is the grain making all sorts of noises? Uh, no reason. No reason at all. It's definitely not prisoners. Okay. After the initial sailor's death was shrugged off as a heart attack, more men started keeling over, and eventually two lifeboats left the ship, with only one man ever making it back to land. When telling his story, the ex-crew member was able to confirm exactly what the ship was carrying. According to this article, it was nitroglycerin, potassium cyanide, and sulfuric acid. That, uh, that sounds explosive. I know nitroglycerin is dynamite, right? Potassium cyanide and sulfuric acid both sound... Well, cyanide is cyanide, right? And sulfuric acid is an acid. All of this sounds very dangerous. Why would it? It's like, is this the ship that has to carry all of the dangerous stuff? Can't we do it separately? But I mean, that sounds like it could be poisonous. Like, I don't know. Sulfur is not poisonous as a gas, is it? Is cyanide? Maybe. I don't know. But it could, I don't know. I always think like gas in these situations where everyone dies. You know, it's like, that sounds like a gas attack or uh, accidents. What a great mix. <laughs> I bet they took extra care and attention in storing all these highly dangerous substances. Oh, they didn't, and they mixed them up to form a deadly glass cloud, and then the nitroglycerin took the whole ship down. Zoiks. Such a, I do feel like a big brain sometimes. I'm like, I don't know what those things are, but it feels like gas. And then the nitroglycerin feels like, I know everyone's like, Simon, obviously. Nah. <laughs> obviously, as soon as you, they read out those things, it's obvious what happened. Look, okay, it takes me a little longer, okay? <laughs> Look, I gotta focus on the reading and my small brain. In 1948, it popped up again in Dutch Indonesian newspaper De Locomotive. The story is also that of a survivor of the Orang Medang, a sailor who managed to escape in the lifeboat and got washed up on an island before dying from the bad condition he was found in. He told the story to a missionary, who then told a writer, who then related it to the wider world. Ah, yes, that good old fourth-hand information. In the Proceedings of the Merchant Marine Council, Volume 9, published in 1952 by none other than the United States Coast Guard, and now we're moving on to a more reliable source, they make mention of the incident which they peg as having happened in 1948. They relate the Morse code message, the location of the st- at the Straits of Malacca, and that when the ship arrived, which is unnamed in their article, everyone was dead. Okay, this is really sketchy, though. Then it feels like two very separate incidents that just coincidentally happened in the same place. Because otherwise, where, I mean, the mirror and stuff, where did they get their information from? Maybe they made it up. But maybe the... This sounds like two separate incidents, doesn't it? The publication describes the scene like this. There were dead men everywhere. Bodies were strewn about the decks, in the passageways, in the chart house, on the bridge, sprawled on their backs, their frozen faces upturned to the sun, with mouth gaping open and eyes staring. The dead bodies resembled horrible caricatures. Even the ship's dog was found dead. Yet the body, this is very close to the other one though, isn't it? But then how would the, the mirror one publish it so much earlier? Yet the bodies seemed to bear no sign of injury or wounds. Then, when a fire was discovered in, number four, in the number four hold, she had to be abandoned. A few minutes later, an explosion followed, and the Aram Medang sank. Wait, wait, didn't we say they didn't name it? Oh, the rescue ship, sorry, I'm so stupid. Okay, okay, so it is the same ship. But then how do you explain the totally different dates? That's so strange. Someone is unreliable, but it doesn't sound like the mirror, because they got to it first. So the Coast Guard just read the newspaper article? Uh, uh, what's the other explanation? They seem to have happened in, unless there's just an error in the year? But then why is it done so much later? It's, which is all making me think that this is just made up. But then these are real sources. This is so confusing. Uh, to this day, no explanation has been offered as to what might have happened to the unfortunate ship's company. This appeared in a feature called We Sail Together, which mentioned several other strange instances of ships being abandoned in mysterious circumstances or being sighted after having been declared wrecked. The article goes on to talk about the Titanic and improvements in safety legislation, so it's presenting all the mystery cases as things that actually happened, not as rumors or ghost stories. Okay, okay, this is beginning to make a bit more sense. This sounds like a made-up one, or like... Uh, they've not been as rigorous because the United. This seems like a publication from the United States Coast Guard rather than some official log of naval accidents and events, which would be a lot more boring and kind of like. That's the sound of the typewriter. I don't know why I had to do that. Monday, twelfth of November, nineteen forty-two. We've encountered a vessel. 
recording Morse code message. And it would just be like that rather than a story. In 1944, a German writer called Otto Mielk published a booklet translated as Death Ship in the South Sea. Uh, this is also this also plays the incident as having happened in 1947 and uh, this is another year as well. It's four, five, six, seven years. Seven years later, guys. The information is like this is it's weird when it's published so much later. So much is going to be changed uh, and confirmed the cargo as danger a dangerous combo of potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin. Milk also gave specific details about the route the Aram Madame was supposedly taking. The Silver Star was name-checked along with its captain with these extra details, giving an air of authenticity to the whole story. So there you go. The Aram Madame exists in the historical record, albeit somewhat nebulously. Does this mean it is a true tale after all? Well, not really. This scant information alone is not enough to convince most people, and there are some who have been looking into this story for years. So let's add a few more strands to the case. Yeah, so far this is all just like uh, newspapers looking for stories, writers looking for stories. Everyone's just looking for a story so people read their stuff. I mean, uh, the irony is a lot lost on me that that is kind of exactly what we're doing. And maybe in a hundred years we'll be like, well, that around it was real. Simon covered it on Decoding the Unknown and he didn't it all over it brutally from the start. So it must be real. So far, I'm unconvinced. I was more convinced at the beginning, and now it just seems like this evidence is not really evidence at all. One of the main issues surrounding the belief that the Orangmadan story is false is that nobody has ever found a ship called the Orangmadan listed anywhere, and there's no record of it in the Lloyd's Register of Ships, which is the authority in listing all seagoing merchant vessels. There are possibly ways to explain this, though. The first is that the ship could have been registered elsewhere, elsewhere or didn't meet the size requirements necessary to register it with Lloyds. If you're familiar with the Malay language, with the Malay language, sorry, or even if you're not, you may have known that the that the orange apes are called an orangutan. This means man or person of the forest, in the same way the name Oran Madan means person from Madan or man from Madan, which is a city in North Sumatran province of Indonesia. Isn't this a Dutch ship? I guess that kind of makes sense. The Dutch were everywhere. Um 1940s though? I guess. I guess, yeah. And Indonesia, that feels... Was Indonesia Dutch? I mean, like, colonially? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. It doesn't feel British or French or Spanish, does it? Spanish, mate? I don't know. It feels Dutch. I'd say it's Dutch. Or maybe it wasn't a colony at all. I mean, that seems unlikely. But, oh, who knows? It's quite possible that the ship was registered in Sumatra or just not at all. It's also possible that the ship was officially registered somewhere and then changed its name for some reason during the final journey. Why might it change its name mid-voyage? This is where the story gets interesting. All the various versions of the tale conclude with the Iran Medan catching fire or exploding and sinking without a trace. What could cause this to happen? There's one line of thought that goes like this. The Aram Medan was originally named after something else and changed its name to avoid detection while carrying out the illegal and highly dangerous task of transporting deadly chemicals such as nitroglycerin and potassium cyanide. <laughs> it's a simpler time when it's like, yeah, yeah, how are you going to escape and like not be caught by the boat authorities? And be like, yeah, well, we just changed our names, didn't we? Easy. Our name was John, now it's Peter. Problem solves. It's like, but you look like a John, you smell like a John, you're transporting the stuff of John. Yeah, 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 but I'm Peter, aren't I? Problem solved. Ah, the past. A simpler time. The purported survivor that washed up on the island told the missionary the ship was carrying sulfuric acid. Let's say that it was carrying dangerous and or volatile chemicals. If something happened and fumes or gases escaped, this might account for the horrible deaths that the crew suffered. It could also have led to the explosion or fire that ended up sinking the ship. If the incident happened around 1940, the Second World War had already kicked off, meaning that it's not too far outside the realms of possibility that a merchant ship was disguised and used to transport chemicals to create weapons or other nas- or for other nasty uses. Yeah, that sounds pretty legit. Like, I mean, <laughs> illegitimate, but it's a good reason for this. Like, yeah, they could have just been sneaking around bombs and shit. That seems super likely in I mean, not just wartime, but like regular time. Peacetime, that's the word for that. Who was using the ship, where they had come from, and where they were going is unknown. But if it's true, at least that particular load didn't reach its destination. If we're, take, if we're talking gases and fumes, there's also the less exciting theory that the boiler was faulty and carbon monoxide spread silently throughout the ship, ultimately suffocating the crew and the poor dog. Carbon monoxide, man. Comes up all the time all the time. I've mentioned it before, I'll mention it again. If you don't have a carbon monoxide detector, get one. If you're hearing things, like go bump in your house, 
It's probably not ghosts. It's probably like, I don't know, just get a carbon monoxide detector, okay? Because it makes you crazy and it makes you think you're th seeing things and hearing things. Carbon monoxide be so crazy. So really, there could be a half-decent case here. All the elements may not have gone down exactly as the legend says, but there may well have been a ship with a fake name hauling cargo of dangerous chemicals that got into trouble somewhere. Yeah, I agree. This all sounds entirely reasonable. I don't really think there's much evidence of it yet, other than a few he bits of hearsay. But I'm not writing off it as some crazy paranormal spook story. It just seems like the, the smuggling ship with dangerous chemicals leaked poison to the screw and then blew up. It's an unlikely chain of events, but it's not like, oh my god, aliens came down and did it. And then they got their anal probes out. Because <laughs> of course they didn't. The boat may well have exploded, or at least caught fire and sank without anyone really getting to the bottom of it. It's the extra details, like the entire crew looking that they'd all died of fright, that turned this into an enduring story. That also sounds like the sort of detail that could easily be made up or explained by like, oh my god, I'm dying, sort of fear which uh, seems an entirely legitimate fear to have. Could a gas leak have caused this kind of situation? I don't know enough about how toxic gas is spread to be able to say whether this is credible or not, but maybe a large amount of a, on a smaller ship would be enough to take everyone out. The weather was supposedly calm enough to allow the rescue boat to board the Aran Medan, so maybe that also helped kept the gas from being dispersed too much. Pirates or other form of human attack seems unlikely, as the newspapers reported the bodies as not having injuries and the boat was not damaged. Would another ship sail up, gas the crew steal something the boat was smuggling and row off into the sunset well the best we can say about that is that it's a theory yeah it's a theory i don't think it's a very likely one i think it's more likely that they got poisoned by whatever they were carrying or carbon monoxide or something if they were real at all of course maybe outside forces were to blame a mr ch mark jr certainly thought so and even troubled the cia with his beliefs in a letter from the CIA archives that was declassified in 2003, the letter from Mr. Mark sent in December 1959 is actually a follow-up from a letter he'd sent in 1958 concerning other mysterious maritime disappearances. <laughs> Did someone at the CIA actually read this? Dear CIA, enclosed are some mysterious maritime disappearances. Let us go through them one by one. Best regards, Mr. Mark. Maybe take away his male privileges. Apparently, had found out about the Aramidan story, was so, so was eager to share his views. These include the theory that the Aramidan might uh, case might unlock a whole slew of other mysteries were it to be solved. He wrote. Also, I have often thought about the many sightings of huge fiery spheres rising from the sea or disappearing into the sea by ship's captains and crews in the 18th and 19th centuries. I don't know why he put the mark, quotation mark, yeah, in both of the seas in this thing. He's putting like quotation marks. Uh, as surely that's the one element of the mystery that everyone can actually agree exists. I did find it very strange. I just ignored it because I thought it was a mistake. Nope, they were really there. Are there any sea deniers out there? I, I mean, yeah, probably. We live in a crazy world. There's Facebook. People are going on there. They're getting into conspiracy theories that are absolutely wild. I mean, there's, there's going to be, there's probably sea deniers listening to this show being like, the sea isn't real. It's an optical illusion. It just makes us feel wet. It's not real. It's not real. How did Jesus walk on it if it's real? It's not real. He goes on to mention a few more instances of things burning in the sky or spontaneously catching fire, but they're all over the place, time and location-wise, and don't really seem to have anything to do with the Iran Medan story. It's not even clear if he's talking about a possible extraterrestrial answer to the mystery. Could a UFO have blasted the Iran Medan with some kind of ray, instantly killing all of those on board? Mr. Mark isn't so explicit in his letter, and he finishes it by saying, Yes, the enchanting sea. What terrifying secret does it hold? I feel sure the SS Oran Medan tragedy also holds the answer to this secret. Again, the inappropriate quotation marks. This time, uh, they were around secret and secret. So, what terrifying secret? Ah, it's like, what, why are you doing that? It makes no sense. Who at the CIA actually read this and why is it a part of records? This should just be thrown away immediately. Oh my god, can you imagine how much paperwork the government and CIA and shit have to hold on to? They must just have warehouses filled with crap crazy amounts of junk. It sounds like Mr. Mark knows a lot more than he's letting on, but he's not giving us enough hints to know what he's going on about. I'm sure the CIA were very interested to read this letter, but probably put it in a pile marked kooks. It's, it's more than a pile. There's probably a warehouse marked kooks. It's also the tipping point of this piece from the vaguely credible into the incredible. So let's move on to the case against the Iran Medan story. The case against the death ship. 
Really? Where to begin? Let's start with when this was supposed to have taken place. There are various dates to play with with most sources, which probably just got their information from each other, say 1947 or 1948. How does this explain the mentions of the ship by name in 1940 in the British papers, where they stated that the sinking had happened in November of 1939? If the story seems unlikely to begin with, it's even more unlikely that the exact same thing happened twice to two unregistered ships, both with the same name, Orang Medan. Yeah, it's basically impossible. I mean, the odds. It's just, like, astronomically low. If it had, there definitely would have been more column inches about it. And what about the other ships in the story? In later versions, the SS Silver Star is named as the rescue boat, but this couldn't have been the case, as while the boat did exist, it changed its name several times over the course of its life and was only called the Silver Star in 1946, which is one of the few years that this story is not rumored to have taken place. This directly contradicts the story that mentions the Silver Star in the German booklet, for example. Also, while the Silver Star was a real ship with a real history, there is nothing in any of its reports about the incident which should have at least garnered a passing mention somewhere along the line. Yeah, there's gonna be a record of this, because we mentioned many times in this episode, governments love records. They got warehouses full of records. I'm sure all those like ships from back in the day, there's probably those captain's logbooks. Like they're probably all still around. And if it doesn't exist, probably didn't happen. In the early 1940 articles, no name for the rescue ship is given at all, which seems a bit suspicious given that they would be the eyewitnesses to the whole event. Also, literally, where on earth did this event take place? I mentioned the Strait of Malacca in the story at the start of the piece. This is a busy but narrow shipping channel linking India to China. As the city of Medan is on its route, that's probably why the ship was named Man from Medan, and so it's been frequently placed there. This makes sense, but it's wildly at odds with the earlier newspaper reports. The Yorkshire Evening Post state that states that the Aramadan was found near the Solomon Islands over 4,000 miles away, that's 7,000 kilometers from the Strait of Malacca. The Dutch Indonesian newspaper, De Lokomotiv, but the events are happening near the Marshall Islands, over 1,300 miles, over 2,000 kilometers from the Solomon Islands, and almost 5,000 miles, that's 8,000 kilometers from the Straits of Malacca. So what are we to make of all of that? Well, uh, it just sounds like they're all copying each other and doing a pretty poor job of it. I mean, I guess journalism in the past, journalism today, you know, it's not always the best at some establishments. And uh, this just sounds like they're just making up some stories or they're like there's enough whiskers of truth to turn it into like a newspaper article with a sensationalized headline, which uh, sells more papers, doesn't it? Apart from the lack of detail, the varying dates and locations, what other bits of mystery can we dunk on? What stands out to me is the radio message. It has been most popularly reported as all officers, including Captain Dead, lying in chart room and on the bridge, probably whole crew dead. Was this all tapped out in Morse code? If so, if the entire ship's crew was falling down dead all around, wouldn't you want to just type SOS multiple times? All are dead would also get the message across a bit more succinctly than bothering to take the time to note the locations of where the officers are lying. And what about the rescue boat? Apart from the Silver Star being seemingly erroneously linked to the rescue vessel, there are other issues surrounding whatever ship may or may not have heeded the distress call. Yeah, so I reckon, you know, I was making fun about Morse code and stuff and then having to tap it out. They must all be super succinct with Morse code. It just makes logical sense. And then to tap out, yeah, the captain's dead. That must be like da -da 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 -da, forever. And there's like in the chart room. Be like, dude, 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 just know. It's okay. The captain's dead. That's enough. <laughs> we don't need to know he's in the chart room. No one cares. It sounds like the sort of thing people would make up and then, you know, very quickly for a newspaper and not think about the SOS, the the the, the Morse code aspect. They wouldn't have known what had happened to the crew before boarding, but then seeing them all dead in the same way might have made them guess that some sort of gas was involved. Would there still be some lingering around? The rescue crew were never reported as having felt any ill effects, and seeing as we have no idea where this took place, we also have no idea how long it took them to reach the stricken ship. They seem to have arrived in the extremely lucky pocket between the crew all dying and the gas is clearing out, and then they managed to leave before the ship blew up. If the Aramadan blew up because of some gas or chemical leak, that would mean that there was still enough present to cause the explosion, so wouldn't the others have also been affected when they went on board? Yeah, I mean, it also could have been like the nitroglycerin caused the explosion and the gas came from the other chemicals. 
Like we say, it's really unlikely, but it is possible. The whole mystery really hinges on the rescuing crew boarding the boat, seeing and seeing the dead men. Otherwise, it would have just been a ship sending out a distress call and then sinking. But as no one from the Silver Star has ever been proven to have come forward, the whole thing has to rely on anonymous or several steps removed sources. Yeah, and then it's like you're getting real sketchy. It's like, why is no one from that ship talking about this? Why are there no logs talking about it? Why is there no registry of this ship? Why, 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 why? There's just, it's not a lack of evidence. It's just there's no evidence. It just seems like some newspaper made up a story, some other newspapers copied it. And when we actually look into it a little more, in a little more depth, it's like, well, those newspapers need to issue a retraction. I mean, <laughs> we're a bit late, but you get my message. Speaking of, what about the survivor that was found by that missionary? Oh yeah, there was that Why well, he just claimed to be. And he wasn't a survivor of the Silver Star or a crewman from the Silver Star. He was from the Aramadang. According to a series of articles from the De Locomotive publication, the survivor of the Aramadan ended up landing at Taungiatol, somewhere in the Marshall Islands, and was tended to by this missionary before succumbing to his condition, be it from inhaling poisonous gas or just being adrift at sea for a while. The only problem with that is that the atoll is a tiny, uninhabited place, so there's no way a missionary would have been there for any reason, much less to stay there, much less to be there to hear a dying man's last telling of events. And while we're on the subject of sources, let's delve into it, as it seems that if ever there was a common thread to where this story might have originated, this is probably it. In the Yorkshire Evening Post article, it starts by saying, An eyewitness account of the last phase of a mysterious sea tragedy has been bought, brought to Trieste by a merchant marine officer who went to the rescue of the steamer Aran Medan off the Solomon Islands last November. So this all comes from one dude who probably just is like, I'm just going to tell a story for attention. <laughs> Trieste, eh? Remember that now? This paper, The paper De Locomotif actually published a series of three articles about the Aramadan in 1948. Their source for the information was the survivor of the poison gas on the ship. He then told the story to a missionary who told the story to one Silvio Shirley, who is named as having told the paper. Is it a coincidence that in 1940, Shirley was based in Trieste, the time and city of the source for the British articles. I mean, it could be, but also, I mean, it's a bit of a coincidence, isn't it? I mean, really, really doubtful. And this isn't the only time he pops up in connection with the story. Obviously not content with the low level of publicity his story seeds had thus far yielded, Shelley wrote another article about the Aramadan in 1959 for the Export Trade magazine based in Trieste. And recently, an additional version discovered from October 1940, making it the earliest printed version of the story to date, has been found. It appeared in the Italian paper Il Piccolo and was written by someone by the name Silvio Shelley. The exact same story then later appeared in the Jor article of 1941. Was this Shelley just trying to create his own piece of urban legend by sporadically mentioning the weird stories to get the public record? Well, very possibly yes. Why? Who knows? Who knows, but if that was his intention, he kind of succeeded, as it was only people determined to pick the story apart that found a co any connection to him at all. While it does seem that just one man was hellbent on getting the story into the history books, it's also probable that ships were transporting illegal cargo and did go down on numerous occasions around the period of the Second World War. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. This isn't an unbelievable story. It's like, there is a ship, it's full with a fill of a bunch of dangerous stuff, and the crew die, and then the ship blows up totally believable story like at the beginning whether this specific instance ever happened it seems likely that no this specific instance never happened and it was just made up by some dude which is really weird because it's not that interesting <laughs> and here we are doing a good 40 minute episode about it yeah Maybe Shirley was trying to point people to some sort of wider cover-up, but as the details changed as much over the years, the story just fell apart as any sort of credible event. Also, there's no evidence. There's no logs. Where are the logs? Even to this day, the short, strange tale of the Aramadan lives on. In 2019, Supermassive Games released a video game called Man of Medan as the first installment of their Dark Pictures anthology series. The game is set on board a ghost ship where chemicals that cause hallucinations are a major plot point. The name of the ship, which players can choose whether to disclose or not, is the Aran Medan. That game sounds kind of cool. I have to say that I'm definitely leaning hard toward the totally made-up side of this story. Well, yeah, me too. Definitely. 
while it would be pretty awesome if a secret undercover operation went spectacularly wrong apart from the everyone dying bit obviously the disparity in the most basic details means that we're looking at a fabrication it is both a bit weird and a bit cool that silvio shelley put so much effort into inserting this almost certainly fictional ship into the historical narrative he definitely seems to have pulled the wool over the eyes of news editors in several countries so hats off to him although he probably annoyed the hell out of any friends and family that he let in on his plot to start an urban legend silvio you're like a dog with a bone about this thing stop trying to make a ranmadan happen i don't know he successfully did he started an urban legend the crazy thing is i don't know much about this dude but that's probably the only thing that i'll ever be remembered for in history this i remember i was doing a podcast before and it was like this there was some legal record of a dude who took like he got arrested for taking a pee in a street or something and that was the only official record of this man who lived like 150 years ago and his name's there and it's like the only thing that anyone will ever remember about him because everyone he knew and is or any way related to him is dead the only thing we'll ever know about that man in history was that he got arrested for peeing in the street we're all going to be forgotten eventually (laughs) oh my god this this got dark Ah. We now live in a time where digitized archives holding decades of information can be searched in minutes and global distances can be mapped and measured from the comfort of your home. To try and plant a similar story into the public consciousness nowadays is a much harder proposition, although as we know, humans don't always seem to let facts get in the way of a good story. I don't know about that, like the internet seems like a pretty amazing place for giving people all sorts of crazy ideas, like that QAnon stuff. The, the, that's like there's new stuff there's new crazier stuff than this that people believe i think the internet's made it even easier to spread like false news and false facts and all that kind of nonsense anyway this has been an episode of decoding the unknown as always i've been your host simon thank you so much for watching thank you katie for writing thank you jen for editing uh i will uh i'll see you in the next episode maybe with christmas jumper maybe not it probably really is february when this is coming out anyway see you next time 